Book three, chapter five of British Goblins, Welsh folklore, fairy mythology, legends and traditions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. British Goblins, Welsh folklore, fairy mythology, legends and traditions, by Wirt Sykes. Book three, chapter five. 1. Welsh courtship is a thoroughgoing business, early entered upon by the boys and girls of the Principality, and consequently most Welsh women marry young. The ancient laws of Howell the Good, died 948, expressly provided that a woman should be considered marriageable from fourteen upwards, and should be entitled to maintenance from that age until the end of her fortieth year. That is to say, from fourteen to forty she ought to be considered in her youth. By every sort of moral suasion it is deemed right in Wales to encourage matrimony, and nowhere are old bachelors viewed with less forbearance. There used to be a custom, I know not whether it be extinct now, of expressing the popular disapprobation for celibacy by planting on the graves of old bachelors that ill-scented plant, the rue, and sometimes thistles, nettles, henbane, and other unlovely weeds. The practice was even extended most illiberally and unjustly to the graves of old maids, who certainly needed no such insult added to their injury. Probably the custom was never very general, but grew out of similar, but other meaning, customs which are still prevalent, and which are very beautiful. I refer to the planting of graves with significant flowers in token of the virtues of the dead. Thus, where the red rose is planted on a grave, its tenant is indicated as having been in life, a person of peculiar benevolence of character. The flower specially planted on the grave of a young virgin is the white rose. There is also an old custom, at the funeral of a young unmarried person, of strewing the way to the grave with evergreens and sweet-scented flowers, and the common saying in connection therewith is that the dead one is going to his or her marriage bed. Sad extremely, and touchingly beautiful, are these customs, but wherever such exist, there are sure to be ill-conditioned persons who will vent spiteful feelings by similar means. Hence the occasional affront to the remains of antiquated single folk who have been, perhaps, of a temperament which rendered them unpopular. The Welsh being generally of an affectionate disposition, courtship, as I have said, is a thorough-going business. To any but a people of the strongest moral and religious tendencies, some of their customs would prove dangerous in the extreme, but no people so link love and religion. More of their courting is done while going home from church than at any other time whatever. And the Welsh Venus is a holy saint, and not at all a wicked pagan character like her classic prototype. Holy Twinwin, goddess of love, daughter of Brychyn, had a church dedicated to her in Anglesey in 580, and for ages her shrine was resorted to by desponding swains and lovesick maidens. Her name, Twin, to carry off, and Hwen, white, signifies the bearer off of the palm of fairness, and, ruling the court of love while living, when dead, a thousand bleeding hearts her power invoked. Throughout the poetry of the Kimrick bards you constantly see the severest moral precepts and the purest pictures of virtuous felicity mingling in singularly perfect fusion with the most amorous strains. Among the choice things of Garant, the famous blue bard, were a song of ardent love for the lip of a fair maid, a softly sweet glance of the eye, and love without wantonness, a secluded walking place to caress one that is fair and slender, to reside by the margin of a brook in a tranquil dell of dry soil, a house small and warm fronting the bright sunshine. With these, versifications of all the virtues and moralities. In the whole range of Kimrick poetry, says the learned Thomas Stevens, there is not, I venture to assert, a line of impiety. 2. The Welsh words sopen and scipio mean a bundle and two bundle, and they mean a squeezed up mass and to squeeze together, but there is a further meaning, equivalent to our word baggage, as applied to a strumpet. 
the custom of bundling is still practiced in certain rural neighborhoods of wales to discuss its moral character is not my province in these pages but i may properly record the fact that its practice is not confined to the irreligious classes it is also pertinent here to recall the circumstance that among these people anciently courtship was guarded by the sternest laws so that any other issue to courtship than marriage was practically impossible if a maiden forgot her duty to herself her parents and her training when the evil result became known she was to be thrown over a precipice the young man who had abused the parents confidence was also to be destroyed murder itself was punished less severely customs of promiscuous sleeping arose in the earliest times out of the necessities of existence in those primitive days when a whole household lay down together on a common bed of rushes strewn on the floor of the room in cold weather they lay close together for greater warmth with their usual clothing on caesar's misconception that the ancient britons were polyandrous polygamous evidently had here its source it is only by breathing the very atmosphere of an existence whose primitive influences we may thus ourselves feel that we can get a just conception of the underlying forces which govern a custom like this of course it is sternly condemned by every advanced moralist even in the neighborhoods where it prevails an instance came to my knowledge but a short time ago in eighteen seventy seven where the vicar of a certain parish midrim carmarthenshire exercised himself with great zeal to secure its abolition unfortunately in this instance the good man was not content with abolishing bundling he wanted to abolish more innocent forms of courting and worst of all he turned his ethical batteries chiefly upon the lads and lasses of the dissenting congregation of course it was not the vicar's fault that the bundlers were among the meeting-house worshippers and not among the established church-goers but nevertheless it injured the impartiality of his championship in the estimation of the methodies i am not sure the bundling might not have ceased in deference to his opinions notwithstanding if he had not in the excess of his zeal complained of the young men for seeing the girls home after meeting and casually stretching the walk beyond what was necessary such intermeddling as this taxed the patience of the courting community to its extreme limit and it assumed a rebellious front the vicar quite undaunted pursued the war with vigor he smote the enemy hip and thigh he returned to the charge with the assertion that these young people had schools for the art of kissing a metaphorical expression i suppose and that they indulged in flirtation this was really too much bundling might or might not be an exclusively dissenting practice but the most unreasonable of vicars must know that kissing and flirtation were as universal as the parish itself and so there was scoffing and flouting of the vicar and as rebounds are proverbially extreme i fear there is now more bundling in midrum than ever three the customs of romanta or romantic divination by which lovers and sweethearts seek to pierce the future are many and curious in all parts of wales besides such familiar forms of this widely popular practice as sleeping on a bit of wedding cake etc several unique examples may be mentioned one known as the maid's trick is thus performed and none must attempt it but true maids or they will get themselves into trouble with the fairies on christmas eve or on one of the three spirit nights after the old folks are abed the curious maiden puts a good stock of coal on the fire lays a clean cloth on the table and spreads thereon such store of eatables and drinkables as her larder will afford toasted cheese is considered an appropriate luxury for this occasion having prepared the feast the maiden then takes off all her clothing piece by piece standing before the fire the while and her last and closest garment she washes in a pail of clear spring water on the hearth and spreads it to dry across a chair back turned to the fire she then goes off to bed and listens for her future husband whose apparition is confidently expected to come and eat the supper in case she hears him she is allowed to peep into the room should there be a convenient crack or keyhole for that purpose and it is said there be unhappy maids who have believed themselves doomed to marry a monster from having seen through a cranny the horrible spectre of a black furred creature with fiery eyes its tail lashing its sides its whiskers dripping gravy 
gorging itself with the supper. But if her lover came, she will be his bride that same year. In Pembrokeshire, a shoulder of mutton with nine holes bored in the blade bone is put under the pillow to dream on. At the same time, the shoes of the experimenting damsel are placed at the foot of the bed in the shape of a letter T, and an incantation is said over them, in which it is trusted by the damsel that she may see her lover in his everyday clothes. In Glamorganshire, a form of romantha still exists which is common in many lands. A shovel being placed against the fire, on it a boy and a girl each put a grain of wheat side by side. Presently these edge toward each other. They bob and curtsy, or seem to, as they hop about. They swell and grow hot, and finally pop off the shovel. If both grains go off together, it is a sign the young pair will jump together into matrimony. But if they take different directions, or go off at different times, the omen is unhappy. In Glamorganshire also this is done. A man gets possession of a girl's garters, and weaves them into a true lover's knot, saying over them some words of hope and love in Welsh. This he puts under his shirt, next to his heart, till he goes to bed, when he places it under the bolster. If the test be successful, the vision of his future wife appears to him in the night. 4. A curious romantha among farm women is thus described by a learnish Welsh writer. The maiden would get hold of a pullet's first egg, cut it through the middle, fill one half shell with wheat and flour, and the other with salt, and make a cake out of the egg, the flour, and the salt. One half of this she would eat, the other half was to be put in the foot of her left stocking under her pillow that night, and after offering up a suitable prayer she would go to sleep. What with her romantic thoughts and her thirst after eating the salty cake, it was not perhaps surprising that the future husband should be seen, in a vision of the night, to come to the bedside bearing a vessel of water or other beverage for the thirsty maid. Another custom was to go into the garden at midnight, in the season when the black seed was sown, and sow leeks, with two garden rakes. One rake was left on the ground, while the young woman worked away with the other, humming to herself the while, A sol sith i gled fidio, doed i gid grevinio. Or in English, He that would a life partner be, let him also rake with me. There was a certain young Welsh woman who, about eighty years ago, performed this romantha, when who should come into the garden but her master? The lass ran into the house in great fright, and asked her mistress, Why have you sent master out into the garden to me? Weel, weel, replied the good dame, in much heaviness of heart. Make much of my little children. The mistress died shortly after, and the husband eventually married the servant. The sterner sex have a form of romantha, in which a knife plays a part. This is to enter the churchyard at midnight, carrying a twica, which is a sort of knife made out of an old razor, with a handle of sheep or goat horn, and encircle the church edifice seven times, holding the twica at arm's length, and saying, Demar twica, plimar wern, here's the twica, where's the sheep? End of Book 3, Chapter 5